Well, the book of John, chapter 8, we're going to look at verse 31. Jesus is actually talking to the people, both supporters and opposers alike. This and very much immediately after the story that we read about the adulterous woman that was caught in an affair. And according to the law of Moses, the Pharisees were right in saying that she should be stoned. Many of us know that story. So I want to give you guys a background, which is an awesome encounter with Christ, God Almighty, expressing the love of God, the mercy of God to a wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked sinner. That being all of us may not have committed a natural sense of fornication of adultery, but spiritual adultery alike. And I see Jesus Christ having this opportunity to express the mercy of God, telling those that were to stone or sin, if those that were without sin cast the first stone. And many of us know that story to tell you the background that in that moment, recognizing the depravity of their own hearts, the Pharisees had to acknowledge that they were wrong. One by one, the stone hit the ground. I want you all to hear that, you're, 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 hear that, the stones. Y'all hear it? All dropping. Where Jesus picked up the woman in her shame, knowing she deserved punishment. Jesus said, where are thine accusers? He said, none, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Then he says the most powerful statement that many of us try to forget. Go and sin no more. It's not enough to receive God and understanding His love, His mercy. Yes, He comes in. He'll sweep us off of our feet. I like to say God has a big S on His chest. And ain't that the truth? That God in our frailty became flesh to come down and save us. It is nothing short of the greatest comic book you've ever read. My Superman, Jesus Christ. But that's just the beginning, church. That in our salvation, in our freedom, it'll cost us everything. The latter part of his mercy, saying, I do not condemn you either. He then says, the commission for us, go and sin no more. It's a lost and dying sermon in the church of today that will allow sin in the pulpit, that will allow sin in the deacons, that will allow sin in the Sunday school rooms, and even, guess what, equal to that, we're all souls, the laity. From the front row to the back row, it is a lost sermon that needs to be preached. Understanding God's mercy exhibited to mankind, giving us the salvation we so desperately did not deserve, comes with that cost. I say salvation is free, but it ain't cheap. It'll cost you everything. Amen? The Bible says that narrow is the gate that leads to life. Few are they that find us, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many are they that find it. Some of us don't truly recognize, and I'll admit even I to myself cannot wrap my head around that truth. That theology that tells us just how small of a path, narrow, that salvation truly is. There's coming a day when we will see just how narrow it is. We will see just how broad, as easy as it is to watch our television sets and see how broad this gate of destruction is that our nation is falling apart. But to date, we don't even understand, truly wrap our head around what he said. That narrow gate brings us freedom, but that narrow gate also costs us our life. Amen? Having said all that understanding, that in this moment, where this woman, in a natural sense, in the culture of the day, should have been stoned, yet Jesus Christ, one of the most, in fact, I'll say, because I wasn't there, but realistically speaking, all the works that he performed is, in this time, the most popular teacher. <laughs> Imagine if 
one of you were being a teacher in the time of Christ who would teach in the synagogues, you'd have a lot to follow when you have Jesus in, in, you know, around about in the town. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard to follow that one, right? But understanding he caused a, a big scene in this moment. So he's got a multitude of crowds that encompasses those that cheered him and those that sneered him. And you're going to find in, the chap in chapter 8 of the book of John, this is probably the most, if, if I'll say, in your face reality checks with the Pharisees that you'll ever read in all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I went through a devotional time. Uh, Early this year, I think it was around in January, where I read the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. And whenever I got through the Gospels, I hit John chapter 8 and whoa, whoa. Read it before, but in contrast to all the other chapters, all the other Gospels, John chapter 8 stuck out the most. I had a conversation with Will about that, and it was around the same time I read it, and he was like, yeah, I know, I felt the same too, right? I was like, when you read John chapter 8, your jaw hit the floor, right? Like, I can't believe Jesus would tell that to certain people. Having said that, don't have the time to cover it. My message, believe it or not, I think, is shortened compared to most. But John chapter 8 is a, mess, is a chapter I encourage y'all to go and read. But now, beginning in verse 31, everybody have a say amen. amen. Good. Most of us have it. If you, know, you don't, it's on the screen, hopefully. All right. Good job. You're awesome, Elizabeth. <laughs> verse 31, it says, Then Jesus... Excuse me, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then, everybody say then. then. What does that mean? Next. Next. Now that you've covered the first, then means thereafter. Am I right? If you continue in my word, then. Ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What a great statement. I'd like to point out that this is him speaking to what we would call nowadays believers. Not the Pharisees that rejected him. Not the people that would sneer and jeer and huddle up amongst themselves and say, what shall we do for these people support him and oh, that they fear him and we can't do... Not those guys. Not the Sadducees or the would you please. <laughs> but the believers. It says verse 31. I will say it again. Just that top part. Then said Jesus to those Jews which... Say it again. Believe. Say it again. Believe. I'm going to make y'all do it until I hear it loud enough. I believe on Jesus. Oh, he has saved me. I believe. Oh, I know that Jesus. Or the, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I go to church. Or worse, the father of all lies you'll find in the latter chapter of this same passage. Satan himself believes. Not a part of plan, but having said that, I've read when I preached in New Life, there's a Charles Spurgeon. If y'all don't know who he is, Google him. Awesome man of God. He said this, Charles Spurgeon, unless our faith makes us pursue holiness and pant after conformity to God, conformity to God, in other words, you don't come as you are and leave as you are. You come as you are, but you leave changed. Yeah, it's not enough to say I'm a Christian. You know, there was a day where if we said that, oh, well, I'm a Christian or I'm a pastor, people were like, oh, man, I can trust this guy. Oh, yeah, he's a Christian. To some degree, thankfully, I think that it's, there's a remnant of that f feeling. But there's so much hypocrisy in the church that you find that it's so and in some cases, it might be a bad thing to say that you're a preacher or, are you, or a Christian. But he says, unless our faith makes us pursue holiness, set apart unto God holiness, and pan after conformity, 
then there is no, then your faith is no better than the faith of devils and perhaps it's not even so good as that right wow if that don't make your toes sore i don't know what would conformity to god salvation isn't a prayer it is surrender. When I surrender, if I find myself on the battlefield and I surrender to the enemy, guess what? I become a prisoner of war. I surrender to the enemy and become their prisoner. And I'm not saying that God has imprisoned you, but understanding that when you surrender to God, it's not a prayer. It's a lifestyle, pastor. Amen? Amen? Now, having said that first point, speaking to believers, they themselves got a little confused. Check this out. Verse 33, he says, they, well, he says, excuse me. He didn't say. <laughs> Verse 33, they answered him. Who's they? Thank you. The believers, the one that he would just address saying, and if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed? Only then, continuing in his word. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What he's telling them is, if you continue, you'll be my disciples, and then you'll know the truth, and then you will, will, shall, shall, meaning not now, but will be free. I don't know if y'all catching this, but here's, here's what I'm getting at. They answered him and said, we be Abraham's seed, Jesus, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, quote, you shall be made free. Y'all see that? We're Abraham's seed. We come from the Jewish lineage. We are the chosen people of God. How can you tell us that we will be free? In other words, why, God, Jesus, why are you saying that we're not free now? Y'all saw that? He's telling them you're bound <laughs> right now. But then, but then you shall be made free. So Jesus responded, answered them, saying, Verily, verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Amen. Whew. I'll say that again. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever. It doesn't matter if you're Abraham's great, 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 great grandchild. Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Because that's the argument, right? That's the argument. Say, wait a second. How are we not free? Because we are Abraham's lineage. Whosoever, guys, it don't matter who your dad is, that is, that is, that is, that is, that is, is. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. He says, and the servant, y'all listen, the servant abideth not in the house forever. Once saved, always saved, can't. Speaking to believers who have not been set free. Y'all hearing this? He said, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but what? The son. The children abideth forever. My dad hired a guy who used to cut our grass on a regular basis. Knew my dad very well. Very good friends of the family. He wasn't blood. He was at the house. He came in the house. But he says... A servant, a servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Bringing to my next point of this whole passage, he's telling them, are you a servant or a son? The only way you find yourself a son is if you lay aside your sin. He said, whosoever committed sin, you're a servant. And you're not only a servant, but you're a servant of sin. Meaning the master that you are enslaved to is sin. 
Son versus servant. But I love this next part. <laughs> because church, if you don't hear anything out of this, you need to hear this. Whew. He said, listen. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Yeah. I'm going to read it again. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Come on, Pastor. Because some of us don't understand deliverance. Because when Jesus comes in, He comes in like a flood. He came in like a whirlwind, a mighty rushing wind. When the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. He doesn't do it halfway, church. He whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Amen. My third and final point. The Lord spoke to me. He said there are no half deliverances with Christ. None. No half deliverances. So once we can accept the fact that it's sin that keeps us servant and we can't abide forever, meaning we'll fall away, sin in the believer's life will lead to destruction. You're going to hell, right. YouTube, internet people, myself included. Sin in my heart will lead me to hell. It don't matter how big the pulpit is. It don't matter what, what pew you sit on the front or the back. It doesn't matter what instrument you might play. Sin leads to hell. Whether you say you believe in God or you don't believe in God, sin has one destination, death. So when Jesus told him, he said, oh, you think you're free, but you're sinning and you're the servant of sin and the servant does not abide with me forever. You got me now. We're talking because it's my mercy that sent me to a manger. It's my mercy that sent me to a barn. It's my mercy that caused me to come and lie in a feeding trough for your behalf. But... You cannot abide in my house forever if you are a servant. When I go to my dad's house, it could be 3 o'clock in the morning. I can wake him up and he'll be there to help me and talk to me, counsel with me, love on me, give me a meal. But if a stranger or even a servant, what do you want? It's 3 o'clock in the morning. You see my point. Too many people want to serve God, but they want to live in sin. And in that instance, that's what he's saying. You're not serving me. You're servant to sin. And worse, even if you were, if you're not my son, you cannot live in my house forever. You're not blood. To be grafted in does not the word of God tell us, church, come on, somebody, that you are sons and daughters of the most high God. You have been adopted and brought into the family. Mm, paraphrasing so look it up we're children your children can abide with you forever co-workers it'd be a little bit odd three o'clock in the morning hey you might try to you know it's a little bit different y'all see my point Whew. I want to bring this point home to say there's no half deliverances because this is what my message title is free indeed church free indeed he said him he whom the son is set free is free indeed no half deliverances when christ comes in he sweeps the whole floor he doesn't go around things he lifts everything up sweeps all the dirt out sweeps all the demons out sweeps all the sin out there are no half deliverances with Jesus Christ. He said, when he comes up to the lame man, rise up and walk. Your faith has made you whole. And does it say, oh, and he got up and he limped away. Thank you, Jesus, for my healing. I appreciate that. I can limp now. Y'all see what I'm saying? 
Nowhere in scripture does he deliver anyone physically or spiritually and it's halfway done. He doesn't go up to the status bar of 75% and stop. 100% status bar, Jacob. For all the geeks in the house. 100% deliverance. Spiritually, physically, emotionally. Hmm. Hot, yeah. You're not lukewarm. You're either hot or cold. You're either cursed or you're blessed. You can't be in between. If you're pregnant, you're pregnant. You ain't half pregnant. I actually heard a commercial there. The thing is you're not half pregnant or whatever. I don't know what it was called. But that's the point, Jacob. That if one day you and Candace bless this family with a new lege. Candace will not be half pregnant. She's going to be wholly pregnant. And that's what I tell people. Oh, Jesus. Oh, he's saved me, redeemed me. Well, praise God. You're going to see it. And I'm sorry. You know what? Can I be honest? I'm going to be honest. Pastor, let's be honest. I've been in ministry my whole life, and that's not tooting my horn. I've literally practically almost been born at church. In the back. I was raised in church. I know so much and seen so much of non-denominationals and fully denominationals. I've seen so much religiosity and so much. In fact, I'm not saying I'm perfect because I've messed up quite a bit. But my point is, is that there's so many people that come and say, Oh, Jesus, save me. Redeem me. I've come to the altar. Come into my heart. Oh, and they radically change. But what happens a week from now, two weeks from now? Oh, come on, church. Y'all, y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. The reality is we don't always just get it and keep it. I've seen my, myself, my own self, who went back to the bondage that I was once delivered from. But the, Jesus told him, he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. You want to talk... Memorial Day, let's talk freedom. But I'm talking about in the spiritual sense. I'm talking about if you have an addiction to pornography, God will deliver you. If you are addicted to cigarettes, God will deliver you. He doesn't do it half-hearted. And here's what happens. You might say, oh, well, I've seen some good people. Oh, but they're struggling. Oh, they're possessed, worse. Or at least oppressed. You know, yeah, oppression is normal for those who are saved. Guess what? Because you're fighting a battle. Get this. You got an enemy, right? Don't expect there not to be a fight. Satan will take the gloves off. Come on. Come on. I'm no boxer. I probably look stupid. I have a terrible stance. Yeah, that's not how you box, right? But when you get saved, church... The line is drawn in the sand and you look at Satan dead in the face and say, I am his. So guess what, church? You will get oppressed. You will have bad times. Your boss might fire you. You might lose your house. It might, your grandma might pass away. Your son or daughter might pass away. Something can happen in your life that the enemy is fighting you. So get over it. Is that heartless to say? That when you join the army of God, this is going to happen. My point saying all of this is that in everything that you do, you are free. There's no demon that's possessing you if you are saved. There is no, no struggle when it comes to the addictions, the bondages, if you are truly saved. My Bible tells me that the Holy Spirit doesn't share space with nobody. You want me to prove it? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Let's go there. Come on, somebody. Everybody say amen. Amen. Oh, man, y'all dead up in here. Say amen. 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 Means yes, Lord. Why are you turning to Romans chapter 8? I'm going to give y'all a little treat. When 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 the Lord told me that the title is free indeed, free indeed, free indeed. Well, I just wanted to look up indeed. I love that, Strong's Jacob. I love that, man. That really rings these words from a language that was written 2,000 years ago, like the word wine, we found out that there's actually a whole lot of 28 different Greek and Hebrew words. Whole nother story. 
But the Greek word is ontos for the word indeed. What that means is truly, in reality, it says as a matter of fact. That's what indeed means. As a matter of fact. Not as a matter of fact, da da da, but as a matter of fact. Truth. Reality. Contrary to the words pretend, fictitious, false, or conjectural. In other words, he's saying, if I have set you free, oh, you all the way free. It's all the way. It's everything. That means every demon has to get out of your body. Amen. That means every oppression's got to leave. Amen. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Verse 2. Ready? Ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. The devil's fighting, see? The devil's fighting. Because it's a message that people need to hear. Because I'm sick and tired of people who genuinely love God are walking in church in chains. Chains, limping away. Because there was a day when someone who truly got saved hit this altar. And there was no addiction to drugs. There was no addiction to pornography. Why? Because he saved them. There's no addiction to anything. Why? Because he set them free. But... It doesn't stop there. What are you going to do, church, when you walk out of those doors? I got a good passage coming up. So hear me. Verse 2, chapter 8. This was the highlight. He says, for the law, this is Paul speaking, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. Made me what? Free. From the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus means that now that I'm walking in this law, the spirit of God, I'm freed from the law of sin and death, which means when I sin, I die. You apply the spirit, you get life. You apply sin, you get common sense. When you abstain from that, and you turn away. Freedom, church, freedom, free indeed. Turn with me, Galatians chapter 5. Now this is, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait, church. I can't wait for y'all to hear this. Turn with me to uh, Galatians chapter 5, looking at verse 1. Galatians 5, verse 1. Oh. Galatians 5, verse 1. If y'all have your, a highlighter or a, an, an app on your smartphone, tap it, save it as a bookmark, highlight it with a literal or digital, I don't care. It says... Paul saying to the book of Galatia, uh, to the church of Galatia in the book of Galatians, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty which Christ hath made us free, church. He's saying, stand in this liberty. Christ has made you free. And hear me. Ready? Are y'all ready for this? And what? Be not entangled. Go ahead, read it. Again, with the yoke of bondage. He's saying, don't go back to it. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. I appreciate that. <laughs> Amen. He's saying it be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Did y'all hear that? Paul is saying, church, you have been set free and you are free indeed. But don't go back to the yoke of bondage. The problem is not that Christians are possessed. The problem is that Christians are going back to the world getting unsaved. Losing their faith, opening the door for demons to come in. The problem is we go back to the things that were once held us in bondage and we go back to it. Same chapter. Go to verse 13. Verse 13 he says, For brethren, ye have been called unto what? Liberty. Oh, say it again. Liberty. liberty. You've been called into liberty. Only use not liberty. Oh, 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 oh. Only don't use freedom. Thank you. For an occasion into the flesh, but by love serve one another. In other words, God has made you free, but that doesn't mean now that you're free, you can go back to chains. That's stupid. Everybody say that's stupid. For those of us who were here at the Iron Tiron Conference Saturday morning, sin is what? And, whoo, praise the Lord. Sin is stupid and it's selfish. 
And that's what it comes down to. Because if you know that sin leads to death, having sin in your life is... In other words, if you know that if you stuck a fork in an electrical socket <laughs> and you're going to get shocked, possibly killed, depending on upon the voltage in your body weight, it's stupid. Oh, man. I'm putting myself in. I feel the heat. But you know what? I don't care. Sin is stupid and it's selfish because the Bible tells me selfish. Why? Sin is only pleasurable for a season. But after that, getting back to the stupid part, is death. It might feel good now. Whoo. I got a high. I'm on. I feel good. You know what? My wife left me, but I'm I'm drunk. I'm with my buddies. I feel great. Next morning. <laughs> Alcohol abuse, more bondage, die of liver failure, literal death, and now spiritual. Burning in hell for all eternity because you were selfish and stupid. Amen. That's harsh. But guess what? It's truth. It's truth, church. It's truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Might be bouncing around, but it's worth it. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Jesus brings deliverance. The only thing that we've ever brought to the table is bondage since the Garden of Eden. So when Jesus delivers you, there was a time when my deliverance came into play and I lost all desire for crack cocaine, crystal meth, marijuana, and the Bud Lights. I lost it all. No desire. My life was radically changed. The Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you're in Christ, any man in Christ connecting to a new scripture, he is a what? New creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all, all, capitalize, underline, highlight the word, all things become new. In other words, there's no trace of demons in your body. All things, he said, all things, but he didn't say half things. He didn't say part of things or even most of the things become new. He said all things become new. 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says, Now the Lord is, is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? So guess what, church? If you're bound, and you need freedom, and you want liberty from these chains of bondage, guess where you need to be? In the Spirit. He said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Common sense. If I'm in chains, and I say, I don't want the chains, guess what? I need Jesus. <laughs> where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So guess what? I'm going where the Spirit of the Lord is. Amen. Drawing the line in the sand, church. That's what we like to do over here. We don't complicate the gospel. He either says choose life or death. And then the worst part is as simple of a question. He said, but I say choose life. He gave you the answer. <laughs> I'm going to throw that one in there. Come on. Verse 18, but we all with the open face beholding as in a glass, looking straight through, no hidden things. I love that. He's saying we're all looking in this glass of glory are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We behold this glory through glass. He's not hiding it. There's no Bible code. You don't have to get... Uh, uh, um, you know, deep into, you know, I remember the Bible code, you pick a letter here and they count so many letters and you pick this letter. And, you know, I, I mean, there was an old movie about that, the Bible code and stuff. I'm not trying to knock that. It was a cool movie. But it's like we complicate the gospel so much. We really, really do. And I don't know why we do that. Yeah, man, to gets a hold of it and complicates the whole thing. He says, I've put in it, beholding as in glass, we're changed from glory to glory to glory. It is a continual process. Now, chapter 6, just turn a couple of pages for me, okay? Same book, chapter 6, chapter 6, same book, verse 14. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Want to know why some of us who genuinely love God and have a heart for it but find ourselves still addicted to pornography or cigarettes or drugs or alcohol and you're like, in this, I've, been, I've tasted the freedom. There was a day when I gave my life to Christ and all of that went away. But here's why. Y'all ready? Amen. Man, y'all. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Y'all ready? Y'all not? Y'all either offended or asleep, okay? Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? That's why he said, if I've set you free, you are free indeed. As a matter of fact, there is most assurance of your freedom. That's why he said that. There's no, no relation with light and darkness. That's to say they cannot go together. It's like oil and water. So when Christ comes in, Satan goes out. And when Satan comes in, Christ goes out. Do y'all get that? You're either saved or you're not saved. There's no in-between. Right, Elizabeth? There's no lukewarmness. You're either blessed or you're cursed. You're saved or you're unsaved. So stop trying to complicate it. If you're bound, you need deliverance. If you're unsaved, you need to get saved. It's not complicated. Come on, somebody. What relationship has light with darkness. And get this. What concord hath Christ with Balal? Satan, right? Right. right? You can't share the same space with Satan in here. If I'm truly delivered, set free, I'm free indeed. All things became new and there is no demons inside of me. I might be oppressed. Everyone's going to be oppressed. But possessed? No. No, no, no. What? If Christ is in you, the hope of glory, right? And it says, what concord hath Christ with Bilal? I ain't never seen in the scripture where Jesus is like, what's up, Satan? Oh, you in here too? All right, well, I'll get this half. You get that half. <laughs> no! Free indeed. If the Son, if the Son, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Amen. Hmm. <laughs> Saying all this as a catalyst to reflect your life right now, looking and say, am I in bondage? Then that means if the Spirit of the Lord brings freedom and I'm in bondage, I'm away from the Spirit of the Lord. Am I wrong? Oh, man, I'm offensive today. <laughs> I'm just a messenger. Continuing on, he's saying, I have no fellowship with that. I don't, I don't hang out with that, with Belial. Or it says, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Yeah. Of course, we like to know this unequally yoked thing is don't marry someone who ain't a Christian if you're saved. Obviously, but let's take it a step further. How much do we invest in a direct communion with people who will pull us down? Because, yes, understand the commission requires us to get people saved. And that will require your obedience to come to that person and love on them, Dwayne. Am I right? Love on them and preach to them. Give them the gospel out of love. Speak the truth in love, not of hate or bigotry like we're labeled by the world. But that's just a, a ditch effort of stupidity as a defense to leave me alone. Let me sin in peace. Don't judge me. I'm not judging you. He is. Man. If you preach the word, you're going to cast the judgment call. Because if a good tree cannot produce bad fruit and we see bad fruit on trees, guess what? They're a bad tree. Yeah. So we're not judging to condemnation, but we are judging righteous judgment. John 7, 24, he said, do it. Amen. He said, the reason you don't judge lest you be judged because you're doing it with a plank in your own eye. If you remove the speck, he then says, same chapter the world likes to quote. They don't continue the passage because he's justifying judgment, but not when you're hypocritical. 
He said, first remove the plank out of your own eye, then you can see clearly to remove the speck. Remove the speck, remove the speck out of your brother's eye. What is that? Judging. He didn't say don't judge. He said, don't judge because you will be judged when you do it as a hypocrite. Right. Paraphrasing. Can't you can't be a hypocrite and tell someone they're living in sin. Duh. Right. It's like a pig telling another pig, get out the mud. Yeah. What's wrong with you? Right. Crazy? Do that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so church, do not be suppressed by the ditch efforts of Satan using the world to silence judgment. Judgment is biblical. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Free indeed. Free indeed. Verse, verse 16, continuing on. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, and God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. What did it say? Did it say with them? Thank you. Thank you. In them. And if he's in me, in Christ in you, Sister Edith, Belial cannot have a cord in you either. He takes up the whole space, God, in you. If Jesus Christ is in you you are free and free indeed there is liberty but you can't have satan in there as well he said i am in you he said i will dwell in them i will dwell in them i will dwell in them i will walk in them in them i will walk in them and i will be their god and they will be my people what did he say church ready wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate united methodist church yes. Amen. how dare you Compromise this word and allow sin into the pulpit. How dare you? I love you and you need to repent and call out to God for forgiveness and stand on the word of God and not be spineless, self-proclaimed Christians allowing homosexuals to be in the pulpit. Come on. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not. Everybody say, touch not. What does that mean? Don't touch it. In other words, I can't even do this. My friend, you're a cool guy. Just, just for example. I'm going to do this to Jacob too. It's fun. Candace. See? I can't even do that. Don't touch what? What does it say? Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Have no part with darkness, because he doesn't have any part with darkness. The implication is understanding if you want Christ in you, you can't have any part with darkness, because the moment you do, church, the moment you relinquish that holiness being set apart unto God and step into sin, Christ leaves. Sorry. That's what it said. What relationship hath Christ with Bilal? You allow demons in, Holy Spirit goes out. Say that again. Say that again. We got some common sense up in this room. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's good. I like that. You can't sing to God and dance with the devil. There's a lot of people in church nowadays, Pastor, that do that. Sing up on stage, dance with the devil. They dance on the de dance with the devil on Saturday nights. They come in Sunday morning singing to God. Hey, you know why I could say that? Because I removed the plank out of my eye. Because I was chief among them. I would hit the barrooms in a Vols Parish. I would snort the lines of cocaine in a crack house in Bunky. I was that person, and I would come to church Sunday morning. I was going to hell. What fellowship hath light with darkness? If Christ said, hey, I don't fellowship with Belial. So if you allow Belial, Satan, demons, or sin, and allow yourself, as he said, to become the servant of sin, Jesus is saying in his word, I have no fellowship with you. Don't tell me that you're a Christian, you can sin. It's not possible. If you're a sinner, you're not a saint. If you're a saint, you are not a sinner. 
Oh, that gets me excited. Very simple. You ain't going to fool God. If that's what you think, you're going to stand before God that spoke the worlds into existence, that sees straight through you like a pane of glass, and you think you're going to fool Him. You got another thing coming. You know what? He already told us what He would tell them. Those types of people. I love how He said this. I never knew you. Notice He never said, well... You were adopted, but I had to divorce you. You came, we hung out, it was great, but you chose to leave. Worse. It is so dire in understanding your salvation. He said it's as if the marriage was annulled. It's as if legally it never happened. So for those of us here today who are free, you're free indeed. For those of us here today who desire freedom, you can be free indeed. Amen? And continuing. Verse 18. I'm coming to a close, church. Verse 18, hear this. He said, And I will be a father unto you. Oh, man. I just... Father. Broken homes. Loss of a family. Divorce. Got more steps in your family than a staircase. I know what that's like. Some of us don't understand Christianity so much because they don't know the love of a father. They don't have a father that would represent Christ very well. They see fathers as alcoholics and drug heads and abusers to not only children but their wives. He said, I will be a father unto you. He will be a father unto the fatherless. And ye shall be my sons, not servants, not servants, not servants. You will be my sons. You will be my daughter, Elizabeth. Sons and daughters. And daughters. Saith the Lord Almighty. If you are a servant, you are bound. If you are a son or daughter, you are free indeed, church. Y'all hear me? Coming to a close. When I came back to Christ, it didn't take 12 steps for deliverance. I was an alcoholic. I was a crackhead. When I laid down, my, my rib cage were... Rib cage can play the xylophone like on the cartoons. I was bound. But when I accepted Christ and I said, God, just be proud of me again, the Holy Spirit not only came in and dwelt among me, He came in and dwelt in me. And in that moment, I opened the door for Christ. What, that, what happened? He came in, and because He has no fellowship with Bilal, He had to leave. All addictions had to leave. They had no choice in the matter. As a matter of fact, when Jesus came, everything that was old was passed away and all things became new. Not a drop of alcohol could, could, could entice me. Not a line of cocaine could entice me any longer. No demon in hell was possessing me. I was Free indeed. To say, 12 steps aren't bad. I commend those who want to change. I don't condemn those who are in a 12-step program. But my imploring to these that are bound, those may in this room and others abroad, 
It only takes one step. It does. He said it. When he comes in, Satan leaves. When Satan comes in, he leaves. The question is, who are you going to be filled with? We're all Twinkies. Pick your flavor. I want to be filled with Jesus. Amen. 12 steps aren't bad, but one step is better. And that's Jesus Christ. The hope.